All okay. Right. Okay, so yes, great to have you all here to today's uh, lunch session, lunch and learn session on the topic of upwording. And um, super happy to also uh, welcome uh, Rivka into the space. And Rivka and I, we met a couple of years ago um, at a bus stop in Cape Town. <laughs> I need to mention that here. And uh, she introduced me to the topic of upwording back in the days and offered me a tiny little go coaching session, which really had a big impact, uh, I would say, on uh, the things that um, emerged afterwards, um, because this uh, different way of speaking to myself and also speaking to others created some kind of mindset shift um, towards um, speaking more of intentions um, that really came from myself instead of like being obliged or pressured or asked to do something for others. So it really created a sense of autonomy and uh, also freedom uh, in how I show up for others, how I actually create in this reality. And um, yeah, it, it, it really changed um, to the extent that um, I'm in a different profession now and uh, I, I really live a very autonomous life, I would say, uh, that I'm creating myself and uh, this is great. Uh, so in this regard, I'm really happy to have Rivka here today to uh, introduce the topic of upwording into the workspace, um, which is also where Like a Zebra is, uh, is um, present in we are um, a small consultancy company, organizational development facilitators, and uh, have those up, up, uh, lunch and learn sessions every every now and then. And uh, as I said, like today, um, together with Rivka, on the topic of upwording, and now I'm handing over to you. Okay, great. And I will do a bit of fast track. Um, for my introduction, is there anything that you would like to know before... We, I start with the presentation. By everything. <laughs> everything, okay. Uh, <laughs> specifically within the everything. So I really have made it a habit not to go, this is what I do, because actually it might be not what you want to know. It might be something else you want to know. So we can have one or two questions. What would you like to know? Jackie. Well, Rivka, I would love to know how it relates to coaching and how it might be different. And I'd love to know what's been the changes that you've seen when you've when you've uh, introduced upward, maybe, or when you work with people who introduce upwording. Yeah. Uh, one I would say is let's go into more detail at the end. So ask that question again at the end, because then uh, it's recorded, Simone, you can look at that later. I would say one of the things how upwarding relates to coaching i've noticed is by sharing with permission observation on how the coachee is using language either spoken or possibly thought and how that may be hindering and limiting rather than liberating in their um either in their development of whatever they choose to develop or or progress if you like or also in particular in relationship with others that they're bringing to the table. So I do a lot of sharing noticings on limiting language and I'll happily go back into that more, Jackie. Um, okay, one other question from somebody else, if there is one. And if there isn't, we can go. You okay? Yeah. Great, okay. So what I would invite you for just these next uh, 25 minutes is to really see if you can be fully present. Okay, so anything that might be, I must. Rem I, I want to remember to do the email or feed the cat or whatever, just maybe make a little note on the side. It goes into your sort of maybe metaphorical coat hanger or cloak room, and then you can pick it up again as you're leaving the session. Uh, as I said, it will be, I'm asking you to, I'm inviting you to be interactive, mainly in thinking without necessarily verbalizing it for the time. There'll be a couple of times where I'll definitely invite you just to throw out a word. Okay. 
And as it is in relation to the workplace, one of the things I would do is start with the sentence of how violent sometimes our communication can be in the work workplace. And I'm using the word violent just to make a connection also to nonviolent communication, which is what upwording really grew out of. So I did training with Marshall Rosenberg. I did live mediation with him on uh, conflict training, um, interviews, and so on over a period of years. And for me, upwording is very steeped and rooted in nonviolent communication. And I'm hoping that what it will do is make it even more accessible because I find nonviolent communication often people go through um, really required to go through quite substantially long courses in order to do something with it. And I wanted something that is really easy to engage with. So here is the offer, okay? Um, no. Specifically, um, words change worlds. Words create worlds, words change worlds. And this is an attempt to evolutionize thinking through the everyday use of habitual language towards a desirable world for all. I use this quote specifically that came up during COVID. Um, well, actually it's, it's after uh, George Floyd was uh, murdered. We will not go back to normal. Normal never was. Our pre-corona existence was never normal other than we normalized greed inequity, exhaustion, depletion, extraction, disconnection, confusion, rage, hoarding, hate, and lack. And more. we should not long to return, and we are being given the opportunity to stitch a new garment, one that fits all of humanity and nature. And that's by Sonia Renee Taylor. And I would uh, say we, we can take the opportunity we can choose to take the opportunity to stitch a new garment. I think it's a, I think the step here is an invitation for a really conscious considered choice making in anything that we know might have an impact. So I invite you just to notice what you already know about how the words that you, that we, that somebody else chooses either spoken or thought impact on ourselves and others. And what probably comes up is, I think we by now, most of us know it can, a thought can easily become a self-fulfilling prophecy. I think that's a pretty standard one that we know. Um, if we go, I never will be able to, we have just decided that that will be so. We've looked into the prophetic uh, future looking glass crystal ball and we've decided it is not going to change. So it becomes a self, or I always will be, or I'm really clumsy. So that one I think is most people uh, know that. Um, it can also be, we know I think that it's very problematic in how we speak to and about one another, because again, people may believe that they are clumsy and therefore will live up to being clumsy. And notice every time that we're being clumsy, therefore confirming the view. I'm sort of noticing a bit of nodding. So I think I'm sort of in the right, in that direction. Okay. So we want to take, I want to take that a little bit further. I invite you now, just with a piece of paper, pen, or on your phone, to write down literally a couple of things of, that you know that you have to do on a daily, regular, or in general basis. So just make a, a note. I have to feed the cat. I need to pick up somebody from school. I've got to finish the report. Just make a note of a couple of things that are need to's, have to's, must do's, Got to no more than two. You can, um you may find there are many. The word need to, especially in England, is very popular. 
at the moment. I need to do this. I need to do that. I need to, need to, need to, need to. There's a lot of it. Even I need to eat chocolate right now. Or I need to have a glass of water. Um, and we're really looking at what is kind of habitual in that and what is the impact of that. The second part is things that you know you should do more of or less of. Usually it's more of a less of. Sometimes it's, I should start. Example again could be, I should, I should not work so close to the deadline. I should plan the day clearer at the beginning, something like that. Feel free to take it into the personal realm if you want. I should do more exercise is a really common one. Drink less or more water. And if you haven't got any shoulds that come up at all, whether they're verbally or implied shoulds, phew, what a liberation already. I would, my hunch is there are quite a few knocking about still in how habitual. And then thirdly, do you have any unhelpful habit or pattern? Unhelpful would mean, for instance, um, I always get seasick when I go on a boat. That's actually a physical one. It might be every time I hear somebody talk about this and that, I lose my temper. I always get stressed. I never get it done on time. There, there'll be always, all the times, every times, nevers in there. I always get nervous when. Just one of them will do. Okay. Um, let me know you've made that note by bringing your eyes back to the screen. Thank you. Okay, thanks Jack, okay. Um, question, and this is the one where I will ask you very briefly, just throw out some words that come up. How do you not like being spoken to? And I really don't mean you can tolerate it. I mean, you just don't like it, or maybe you deeply hate it, or you just absolutely don't want to be spoken to. So what comes up? How do you know? I just open your mics. How do you not like being spoken to? Like with a shirt. <laughs> With a should, yeah, you should do exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's kind of it could be educational. It yeah. could be maybe uh, mm -hmm. patronizing. Yeah, mm -hmm. what, exactly. What else, Peter? Uh, the you're always. Oh, I see. I come up with them. You're always yeah. So generalizing about what you do. So you're being told what you do. Lovely. Thank you, Jackie. Maybe um, like in a command and a command and control. Do this. Do that. Being commanded do now. Do is it a maybe? Do you like it or do you not like it? Being told what no. you don't like it. Okay. So no. being commanded or demanded of being told what to do rather than asked. Mirja, anyone to add? Yeah, something like a belittling. Uh, approach like belittling in a way like uh, I, I don't really have an example no that's uh, fine yeah. it's belittling it's a being talking spoken down to and Simone I'll, I'll, I'll use a... Yours as a patronizing one the sort of the should often is a way of being patronized now what you really should do is as if you're really yeah so interesting enough notice that these come up at the moment really early on um, the patronized which usually has something with the should in it comes up by every group at the moment that I've been working with for the last three, four years, ordered what to do, which you, Jackie, came up with and aggressively. Okay. Mm. The others that come up and just check if there's any of them that you do like. So this has been what people have with, you know, when there's mm. a bit of time, we go into it more. Uh, being interrogated. 
So why did you do that? Being judged, being told who you are or what you are, what you do. That's yours, the feta, which is the, you always do that. Disrespectfully spoken down to, which is what you've just mentioned as well, Amelia, uh, criticized, being compared to, rudely, spitefully being dominated. It's part of the being commanded, uh, impatiently, dismissively, uh, ignored and, and so on, yeah? And there will be more to add. I'm I'm sort of taking it that probably everyone around here doesn't like being spoken to in that way. Okay. The reason is, is because an imp there is an implication that is as if you're stupid, wrong, or incapable. That's what we tend to hear in that. Generally, also, often, that is what is implied. I'm mm -hmm. speaking in that way to you because I do think that what you've just done is stupid or you too stupid to do it in the way that you should do it, according to, or you've done something wrong. So the blame comes into it being blamed or the incapable, which is quite close to stupid. I've got some nice visuals here coming up. It's this sort of the feeling that you're being made to feel stupid, spoken down to, if you want to have a little look, they are just a sort of, um, I'm changing, you can see, I'm moving from the design to having um, the visuals. Um, so you see in this PowerPoint presentation, two styles going on. And you can see what's happening in the blame as well, the hierarchy that's coming into it, the being labeled by others, which is a bit different to giving ourselves a label. We tend to be okay with that. It might still be limiting, we generally don't like it when somebody else says you are or what you do is. Yeah, yes, yes. the diagnosis, it's a label. Yeah. We have one more person waiting in the waiting room. What do we yeah, yeah, just let them in. Yeah, yeah, okay. Sorry. We had before said not let people in, but we are going to. Okay. And being ordered. And that's the one, Jackie, you brought up, being commanded, being ordered. And that's the one I want to work with today. So I'm going to give you just a, a section, which is the one about being told what to do, being ordered what to do, being commanded. How do you tend, how do you personally tend to respond when you're being ordered, commanded, told what or dictated to what to do? And you might recognize your face here. And it may depend on the context, and it may depend on who. And it might be that sometimes you are more able to tolerate it because it's part of your contract, or it is something to do with partner or family. Nevertheless, it will be demotivating somehow. So do you tend to rebel? So you get an order and you quite simply are not going to do it. And in your mind, you might go, or even verbally, who are you to tell me what to do? Or don't tell me what to do. Depends what your relationship is. So it's a it's an outright rebellion. I'm not going to do it because of you telling me rather than asking. I might have been perfectly fine to do it. It's not about the content of being what's being asked. It is how I'm being told. Or do you tend to resist, which it means you will do it. And that usually happens in the workplace because it's part of the contract, because there is maybe some fear around not doing it or saying, I don't want to be spoken to like that. But what you will probably do is do it slower, later. You'll probably go, oh yeah, yeah, I'll do it by Friday. Magically, you'll do it by Monday because you get in on Friday afternoon. Uh, and the quality will lack because there is a sense of joy that isn't really there because you've just been told and it really affects our motivation. And just notice how a little thing like that about feeling we're being ordered or told impacts on the quality of work and actually probably the speed of it, certainly quality. Or do you tend to actually resign because there's too much fear of the consequences because of the relationship you have with that person. And that can be in the workplace and it can be elsewhere. And I would just watch that place. If you have any relationships where you just do tell, you do what you're being told because there's too much fear, it really erodes our sense of self and confidence. 
might call it self-esteem, might call it agency, and so on. But yeah, we generally have this no, I'm just going to simply refuse. And at the moment, I think there is also an increase again in no's. No, I no longer want to. I am not going to do that. And we might feel that we come up against a block, a barrage of no's. The reason it seems that we have this rebellion or resistance or resigning or even a fourth one, a simple refusal to do, to even engage, is because an order, a command, a demand generally threatens our sense of freedom and, and autonomy, which is about wanting to choose what I do. I want to be in charge of the, 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 the choices I make, the things I say yes to or no to, how I work or maybe when I work or what I do. So it really threatens, and this is where it really is with the end with nonviolent communication. It threatens our sense of freedom and autonomy, which is why we then go into rebellion. It also can uh, threaten our sense of equality, which is that somebody's put themselves above us. They've taken a hierarchical position, a, a position of, author of authoritarianism. They've put themselves in authority maybe without us giving them the authority to make decisions over us or coercing us. It's a form of coercion. It might even be a, a position of supremacy, which puts the equality out of kilter. All of those, by the way, the demands and all the things before put the speaker in a position of higher than the one spoken to. And that's why there's those reactions. Or with the resigning, we may feel that we're just not safe enough to go, actually, I don't want to do it like that, or in this way, or in the way you're speaking to me, or at me, or down to me. And so because the safety is threatened, we then respond by doing it in order to maintain the safety. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? And the one about not... You might have noticed sometimes you or others just simply disengage. That's often around health and well-being. In order to look after my health, physical, mental, I'm simply going to stop engaging. I think that's what happens also at the moment when people do go into uh, doing a day of self-care. It might be part of that. It's also something that's Things come and, and you know, we, 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 we test them. But um, the disengagement, I would say, is I really i am not going to engage with that. It's going to be too stressful. It's too problematic. It's da, da, da. So I'm just going to not even, I'm just going to walk away, which is very different to rebellion. Okay, so I'm going to add that to the slide. It's not there at the moment. I want to go into the words because that's what upwinding is offering. How do we spot that a command an order, or in German, a befehl, is actually happening because it requires language. I can't give you an order or a command or dictate to you alone with my eyes or physically. I can physically push you if I've got the, 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 the force. Generally, we require communication. And we notice that in the workplace. So the word must is a real big one. It's an order. It's a command and need to. And what they definitely have in common is that they are they don't have a question mark at the end. There is an exclamation mark. We might even change the words or take the words out. The moment there is you must, you need to, you have to, you got to, you will do, and there's an exclamation mark, whether it is written or implied, it becomes an order or command because it's no longer open to yes or no. So the intention that drives the sentence is you will do that because it has to be done because I say so, or the workplace say so, or I know what's good for us, what's right for us. There's a right and wrong in there as well, okay? It, the moment there is, and um, uh, um, how do you say a question mark? And there is an inflection. There is an invitation 
for there to be a yes or a no. Therefore, it doesn't stretch our sense of autonomy. So here are some examples that people have come up with. So just notice how they land when people tell you, you'll recognize some as you read them. You have to take the bins out. It's your turn. You really need to apologize. You've got to be more or less social. Uh, watch less TV if you want to be healthier. Definitely drink less or drink more water. Uh, you need to go to that meeting on Friday. You've got to manage your time better, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and just notice how the joy for what you're about to do is really increasing or not. It's probably going more in sort of the downhill direction. And maybe sometimes we go, why are you telling me this? I know that. And actually don't tell me, ask me. Yeah, whatever's going on. Simona. So, yeah. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so interesting. Have a good moment. Yes, I'm keeping you in my mind. Filakia <laughs> Prala. Yeah, so, so. You can see the, the, the recording if you want to. Ask ah, me. yes. Oh, that would be wonderful. Yes, please. Thank you. Media. Okay, thank you. What happens when you turn it to I? I have to. I have to go to work. I have to take the bins out. I have to manage my time better. I really need to get this done by the end of the day. I've got to go to that meeting. I need to pay the bills. How motivating is it? How successful is it? And how effective is it? Some people sort of report that it feels like really being behind a wall. Other people just report that, that those long lists of have to do's essentially induce stress. Some people say it feels like being shackled by yourself, not even only by others. And what happens when in the workplace we say we must, we need to do this now, do it tomorrow, we need to get the report done. What does it add to the quality, I wonder? What does it take away? Does it mean that we are potentially constantly in a stress-inducing situation, which for some people creates quite a bit of anxiety? I would say stress is also still quite popular. We still have courses about stress management. To me, that suggests that we're still accepting that stress is an inevitable part of working and living. Maybe the next step is to question that and go, is, or maybe to say, actually, I am not accepting that stress is an inevitable part of work and living. There are periods of stretch before a funding application goes in or a project report goes out or a new product is launched. They can be highly satisfying, those three weeks or whatever they are of a real stretch. They're very, very creative. There are sprints often at the end, the last 24, 48 hours before something opens or gets launched. They re require not to be stressful, especially if we make time for the unforeseen. If we actually do a contingency, not just in budget and money, but we make time contingency. So if we take health and well being seriously, then I'm wondering if we can maybe let go of the idea of stress altogether. I threw that one in here quite early because I know that by the end, we may not have so much time to go into that. Moving on to the difference on to should, and just please open your mics. What do you feel is the difference between you should do or, or you need to, when you hear it. I think it has, it opens a little window for, we should do it, but mm -hmm. it's there's less stress and anxiety than we must. But there's also a little bit of guilt creeps in, I think right. we should, <laughs> we should, yes. we should do it. Fiti, you're nodding your head, absolutely. It's a hypothetical demand. It does seem to be open. It's a possibility. And yet there's something else going on there that is almost, I think, more problematic. 
And it's exactly where you're going, Jackie, with the guilt. How come it is so guilt-inducing? Um, it's a form of advice, and it's generally uninvited. So if you have a little look at that, it puts the person who's speaking very much on a sort of up there on that pedestal, speaking down to. That's why it came up in quite early as a sort of the, when people tell me what Simone said, you should do. It's a very patronizing way. So it's an uninvited advice. I'm going to use my brain in order to tell you what you need to do, because I know more about your life than you do. Potentially is what can be implied. And that's also where maybe relating to coaching, it's so important that the coach, the mentor, whatever, it does not go into that, I think, because at that moment, you are no longer in this position, bringing your expertise to it. You're putting yourself in a position of an expert, an expert on somebody else's life, an expert on somebody else's life. And so for me, again, that's another area of upwording is could we maybe let go of the expert and meet each other with expertise is always at that horizontal level. It just, it might be that my expertise, let's say at the moment this, is foregrounded today. Tomorrow it would be yours, somebody else's, okay? So notice how these sentences land on you. Well, it's obvious that you should do this, that and the other. It's obvious what you should do. So there's a real implication of stupidity in its intent. The best thing to do would be to do this before that. So you don't even see the should or hear the should, it is an implied should. And that's also really crucial on upwording is the word itself um, is what we notice. We may also notice the intention of that, if you like, hypothetical demand based on a moralistic superiority. There's a moralistic position in should without the word should even being present. If I were you, I would. Now, some of you probably already go, well, you're not me. So great. Thanks very much, but no thanks. And some, some of us react much stronger to that going, well, I'm sorry, but who are you to tell me what you would do? And actually, when you tell me the best thing you would to do would be, do you think I haven't thought of that? Yeah. And we might hear you should leave that job, you should become a singer, you should do more or less of this, you should really back off and you should say that way and exercise more and so on and so on. What happens if you go into the shoulds that you tell yourself? I should do more of or less of. You've written one down earlier. Question is, how effective are they? not so my guess is either it's a pretty damn certain way that we're not going to do it because of even our self-talk of that moralistic higher position there's like a little voice that then goes who are you to tell me what to do it's like a little you know dialogue with self i feel it so for me that little voice is here and i'm going well i'm not going to do it then because I'm actually reacting to the voice, the moralistic superiority, rather than the content. Or exercise is a great one. We'll start doing it, and then we'll just stop. Because actually, it hadn't gone into a decision-making to, I will do it. It is still out there. It is, it is you know, um, a good piece of advice from what is a right, good, wrong, or bad way of being or living or looking after ourselves or doing things. It hasn't yet made it to... I will do more exercise. And how much exercise actually do I want to do? Every day, five days a week, once a week. In fact, I might want to do it in three months time. I don't want to do it yet. That is conscious considered choice making. What it does do though, with that little moralistic debate, and I will take it out of his Christian overtones. I didn't even realize someone said the other day, oh, you've got kind of angels in there. That does actually suggest um, something. Um, so with the little halo in there, mm, I know what would be the right way you should, I should do things because it would be good for me or bad for me. 
But you know, bingo, we get the guilt because we don't do it. I I should do the dishes before I go to bed. We probably won't do them. We then come down in the morning and feel guilty. Whereby if we go, do I want to do, do the dishes before I go to bed? Actually, you know what? I don't want to do them today. Therefore, I wake up in the morning and I don't feel guilty because I've made a clear choice at that moment to go, I'll do them in the morning. Or we, I go, yeah, I will actually do them. So even that little shift in our own shooting uh, is huge. And if it's other people telling us all the things we should do, sometimes people have gone, it's like, please no more, I can't have any more shoulds. It's quite, quite a big bag to carry, especially all the shoulds that are external and with our families and then our work and so on. Um, so that's an image that we've started choosing to, 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 to create because it feels very burdensome, all the shoulds and the need tos and the must tos and the lists are really, really long. Oh, and then when the lists are really long, I'm going to go back. There is an interesting satisfaction in ticking off. And is it really that we want to tick off lists and get the satisfaction from the ticking of having got something done? Or is it that we want to get the satisfaction of how we're doing it and the spirit and the joy in which we're doing it and the creativity around it? It's a, it's a new one I'm really thinking. I'm noticing how, oh, great, I've got 10 things done today. What? does that actually mean I got 10 things done I got them done rather than going I really like the way I approached that and put some reflection in I really enjoyed that the way I did that I'm really pleased with or proud of so basically in summary if we want to have more guilt stress or anxiety because there is a guilt stress and anxiety competition out there still then all we require to do is up on the shoulds, the need tos and the must tos It will definitely add to the stress mess. Sorry, there's the stress mess. And I don't know if you notice, but often there are the conversations where somebody goes, how are you? And the person goes, God, yeah, I'm really stressed. I've got to do this, I've got to do that, and then I need to do this, and I've got to also do that, okay? So it's the quantity of things. And then isn't it that maybe we or somebody else goes, yeah, I know exactly what you mean, it's really terrible. I feel the same, and I also have to do this, and I need to do it, and I know I should do all these things, I've got no time to get around. So we're competing who is more stressed. And I think part of that is our consumerist, if you like, capitalist, society where it is about production and doing a lot and the value that we unfortunately many of us think that we have is by doing a lot if we do a lot we are important because we're needed because we do a lot of things that is the value is the quantity of doing rather than the quality it's quite rare that we hear how are you doing great I did one thing today I really enjoyed how I did that yeah. So just notice when that happens. And it's a habitual thing. It's not so easy to not enter into it, to go, yeah, I'm really stressed too. When we do check-ins, I really still hear at the moment a real habit of I'm tired. The moment somebody goes, I'm really tired, I'm really exhausted, I'm really worn, it, it sets off a sort of a peer, a, a group funk. Next person goes, yeah, I'm really tired too. It's quite hard for the third or fourth person to go, I feel really refreshed today. And I notice when that comes into the room, how that also can inspire us to go, oh, refreshed is actually possible. We can share our joys, not just our woes. It's also a real form, going back to the demand and the command, which is where we're at, of being controlled. Commands, demands are a form of coercion. It's a form of controlling other people. It's even a form of controlling ourselves by believing I don't do things unless I tell myself. That's worth unpacking. When actually we know how we don't want to be spoken to because it's reducing motivation. As we went back to the beginning. I've not yet met anybody who says they like being told what to do unless they've given permission. 
and entered the army or entered the police force or gone, um, or it might be in a relationship or it might be in going, uh, look, I don't want to think today. Can you just tell me what to do? Could you just give me the ingredients of the recipe? Could you just tell me the next step? That's an invitation. That's very different. I'm giving you permission. In fact, I'm asking you just to tell me. Yeah. Otherwise, it's a form of control and power over. And the whole thing about upwording is really, can we take the power over habitual ingredients, if you like, the tools used that are that manifest as language, out of language, create an archive, I call it activating the archive. So they literally go in there, it's a choice, and we start living without them by replacing them in order to also facilitate a new way of being with one another rather than above one another in a power over relationship. So we're moving towards a power based one. Okay. So this is going to be a little bit shorter. How do we get from there to this? And it's about noticing when on self. That's my invitation. Please don't go around and start noticing on others going, oh, you mustn't use the word should. It's really bad for you you know, because you're right in the same territory. Uh, so no sort of correcting people, that's already patronizing as well. But in ourselves, I can notice when I use the words must do, need to, got to, have to, with the team of people I work with, with myself. I can notice when it's in my intention because I might feel, oh, I've only got an hour and this really wants to be done. So I'm going to use coercive language because I believe that that is the only way people will do something. I've got to make them do it. Notice how we fall into that hierarchical relationship. I've got to make them do it, therefore I've got to force them to do it. And I'll probably put a little consequence there. We really need to do it, otherwise we will. So there is a threat often that we may imply or even state. So what that reveals, if I notice those words should, must, have to, need to, it reveals that coercion is present. It reveals that I have taken a hierarchical position in relation to the other person or people or in relation even to myself. Okay, so at that, that moment, I'm engaging in the form of superiority. I'm engaging in, I would say, an outdated language of power over. I can then choose to make a shift. I'm not forced to make a shift. I might just notice it. I might go, okay, I'm really noticing that the only way I do things is when I tell myself, what is really going on there? Do I want to unpack that? If I go, I do want to shift it because I understand how it lands on other people and it is demotivating, I might go, go, okay, I'm going to shift that now. The way I then shift that is to check. What belief am I bringing into the situation? Do I continue to choose to believe that people won't do anything unless I tell them or make them, that I won't do anything unless I tell or make myself? Or could I be, bring a different belief in, which is actually, I believe that people will do a, you know, their work creatively, satisfyingly, and actually uh, that the quality will increase if I make requests to myself and to others. And that we find agreements, that we're standing in conscious, considered choice. Intention. Is my intention to connect with the other person? to find a mutually agreeable next steps forward, plan, action plan, outcomes, goals, aims, dreams? Or is my intention to try and make them do how I think it should be done? And what position do I take? Do I take a position with or do I take a position above? If we get these three things clear in our minds, it will automatically inform our attitude and approach toward others. There will be a kind of a, a curiosity and a kindness already in place. Curiosity meaning that if something happens that we don't, we're surprised that somebody says no to something we are asking, requesting, we'll probably go, oh, what's preventing you from saying yes? Rather than being panicked and reverting, but you must do it. Yeah, as an example. So, 
I think that's enough. So it's kind of, we remember it as kind of P-I-P-P-I-P-A-A. -A. I'll, I'll, send, I'll send it through and you can make your own anagram. Um, so that's a sort of check thing. And then we kind of realize, is there actually anything that we have to need to or must do? I know that's a big statement. And I would propose there is nothing that any of us ever need to have to or must do. Breathing will happen automatically unless we choose not to, or we hold our breath. Eating, we will eat unless we go on hunger strike and we will die. Unless we find a solution and people are beginning to be frozen. Apart from that, I would say that when you get up in the morning to go to work, it is because a choice actually has been made. It's hiding behind the I need to get up to go to work. It's hiding. Because with the need, I need to go to work, then comes because someone's making me. I don't really want to. Someone's making me. So what I'm doing is I'm externalizing responsibility. The moment I go, I simply am getting up to work because I want to have the steady income. Mm -hmm. I want to continue this post. I'm already sitting in no agency. There is no one standing with, with a gun to my head, making me get up, literally. And aren't there days when even though we could get up and go to work, we don't. We do choose to stay home. We do choose alternatives. So it's something about being, the invitation here is to stand in conscious, consider choice or realize when we are. That means we internalize responsibility and we're much more likely to go, do you know what? I don't want to carry on with this job. I am gonna look for another one. I am not enjoying it. It isn't doing well for me or actually I wanna have a change. So the proposal here is then to shift it to upwording is to simply, if you have a little look at the screen at the moment, is uh, to bring in the question mark. I might have a little conversation. Do I have to, need to, or must? And remind ourselves, no, actually I have some choice here. I may have very little options available. So I wanna make a differentiation between option and choice. I may not, I might be in situations where my options are really, really limited. I might feel I have no option. Where I have agency is in how I then choose to respond within that situation. That comes from an, a Viktor Frankl quote, actually. I may have no control over my circumstances. The last of our given freedoms is how to choose to respond within any situation. And that was actually having been in the camps and uh, his attitude towards his, if you like, perpetrators or oppressors. But if we put the question mark in, it becomes a, do I want to do this? Other words here, and feel free if you want to take a screenshot or write them down. Are we prepared to engage with or agree to the criteria that are required to bring this project to fruition? or to make this funding application. Are we prepared to, and I mean, thank, one for you, Jackie, would be, because you're based in England, an organization I work with where I'm sitting right now, Islington Mill. We chose not to go for NPO funding with the Arts Council because we were not prepared to take on the conditions because it meant that everybody would definitely get seriously stressed because we haven't met anybody who isn't reporting that, including the funding body Arts Council officers who are actually reading the applications. Uh, who want to, st to stab their eyes out for pain relief. Um, so are we prepared to take this project on board? Am I willing to? Would we, who is willing to? Who would be willing to? Because sometimes it's not the nicest job. Who's willing to empty the bins? Would we like to? In fact, I, I really would love to get involved in this part of the project or this particular element. I can't wait to. And somebody recently said, I get to do this funding application. I get to write the proposal. I thought that was a fascinating 
way to go. It's not that we have to, we get to do it. And then we might actually be successful and then get that commission or the fund in order to do the project that we've wanted to do. So these are huge options. And, some, and we can also just leave the word aside. We can just say, I am picking up the phone. I am going to the next meeting. I will pick up my child. I will finish the report. I don't require to put the need to must do or even the want or willing to. I can just go into the descriptive, I do. I'm picking up the phone. I'm not picking up the phone. It's underpinned by, by choose. And I'm slightly over time, I'm coming to the end. We end up then having much more of a, this is what I'm prepared to do and willing to and want to, and this is what I'm not. I'm going to probably start making some no's to it. I would suggest I have felt in my life since archiving those words, and I really have archived those, and with my with our team as well, we notice when the should arrives and we go, oh, what's going on here? Oh, some external pressure. Okay, how do we want to respond to it rather than react? Okay, other than that, for our work, they are absolutely absent. They really never, ever, in this case, I would say never, ever get used. Other than, like we say, they come in sometimes a need or a shit comes in. We go, oh, look, it's just landed. What's going on? What does it reveal? So there's a lot more breath in the work. There's a lot more freedom. It's really limited liberating and and some people have reported that the chore can then become a choice i'm choosing to brush my teeth because i'm no longer being told to okay this comes when i'm also not doing in the relation of work but in the family and home workplace and the children but the work the home people do report a sense of time and space more time more space in time actually more space in time so the point is that really small shifts in the way we speak can I would say absolutely do create huge impacts. One, on our health and well-being, and two, also are no longer feeding into the upkeep of hierarchical authoritarian systems of superiority and supremacy. So for me, every time that I would reach to a must or a need to a have to, I know that I am fueling a system. I, I actually want to be part of dismantling or I'm part of dismantling. And there's a bit of a overlap at the moment because we are upkeeping whilst we're saying we want to dismantle. So my invitation, and you can do it after this session, is to take your must-dos and your need-tos that you wrote down earlier and just check, actually, are you willing to do that? Do you want to do them? Might it be a letting go of those that you don't or not yet or not at this moment or you do want to do them in half a year's time? Can they survive a question mark and therefore become a want to do list rather than a, the need to do list? Um, that the should, same thing, can they be turned into actually a want to do more exercise? In this case, if yes, how and how often and when? And if not, actually, I don't at this moment want to do more exercise yet or want to get faster at typing, or want to do a plan for the day. At some point, I'd like to explore that. Right now, it just becomes another thing on the have-to-do list that I then don't do and feel guilty about. And with your um, habit, your pattern, when you've got something which is probably I always da 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 when da 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 what happens with a statement like that you have just predicted the future you fixed it it's a crisp it's like a crystal ball prophesizing i always get really nervous when i go to network meetings bingo your brain will seek and find the evidence however flimsy to to prove you right to support your hypothesis you'll notice the moment of nervousness go see See, I told, I told you, I told you I'd always get nervous. Your brain will not notice all the moments in that network meeting when you actually felt comfortable, when you had conversations, because it's not a hypothesis in there. So the thing to do is, without lying to yourself, is just uh, replace the generalization because it probably wasn't always. So up until now, 
I've noticed there have been times, there have been moments, maybe there have been many moments when I felt my nerves at the beginning of a network meeting. It probably won't have been always. And then put it into, and therefore you put it into past tense. Up until now, there have been times when, in whichever order, yeah, I've noticed there have been times when I got sick on a boat. Actually, it hasn't been all the time. This is a personal one of mine. Since that, turning that statement a few years ago, I have been on ferries recently. I didn't get sick at all. I did lie down, not to, and I didn't look out. Well, I took that out, that, that fear out, and I've been on choppy smaller ones and actually went, wow, this is enjoyable. So, and I have also gotten uh, a, a turny stomach when it's gotten more, but I didn't come in with being sick because I told myself I always get sick. So even physically, it can make a difference. So I would just like to finish there because we are one minute over and we've got no time to do anything else. Um, but just to end that, freedom, equality, safety, and health, sorry, health mobbing is not on that one, may turn more into this kind of a life. And I'll send that through. We might be aligning our words with our ethos. That's the point. We're moving towards a power with rather than the power over scenario. And this is like the whole of upwording. And it's a little spread, which I'll send. And we've just done the first bit on the top left. So there's a few other bits that I'm happy to share. There's more. That's sort of a little bit of a palette. Um, and you'll get that of the kind of things we do. So I'm just going to finish there and kind of go. If anybody wants, has time, wants to stay on a bit, we definitely can have a bit more of a debrief now. And how does it manifest at Islington Mill? I've already mentioned a bit about it. And if you're going back to work now, then... You know, thank you very much for coming. But please unmute yourself. <laughs> Thanks, Rivka. That was great. I really, I really enjoyed that. Very, um, it's really fascinating. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm, I hope it made a little introduction too. There's also two podcasts available, one in German, one in English. The website's going to be relaunched um, in about a month's time and has several other translations, written ones. They haven't been recorded yet. There's quite a few longer sessions already recorded that up. There's interviews up there and there is a Friday evening practice. I say Friday evening because I'm sitting in the UK time zone five to six, the German and other CEST time zones is six till seven. Tonight, we're actually having our every two months open to total newcomers. People can come anytime, but that's one that's a bit more uh, explained as to how it works. And that's literally a peer practice. There's no teaching. It's a practice ground of noticing. It's also a really nice space to be able to go, this has happened today. I'm really frustrated and da da da. So you can get, um, you can get some frustrations out up to three minutes and then you're invited to do some self-noticing. So that is tonight. Um, and if anybody wants to just drop me a quick email. Hi, Anna. Hi, Rivka. I haven't seen you for so many years. It's so lovely to see you. Um, sorry, I I uh, missed a lot of that um, because I had the CES time in my head. So apologies. But does this, um, the session you talked about this evening or this session, is this a new going to be regular thing or is it it has been regular for four years now nearly wow. it started in covid and had a lot of attendance since the world sort of like also live as well as uh it fluctuates sometimes there's two of us sometimes there's eight people so it ha has happened a few times over summer and no one turns up but there's a little whatsapp group going who's coming tonight so uh that happens um so i can easily if you drop me a quick email i'll send you the i'll send you the link yeah i can't i'm um, uh my, it's my oldest is birthday tonight, but I'd love to join because oh, yeah. um, what so I remember you talking about this when you trained me as a life coach many moons ago, and I actually used your saying this morning with my husband that changing the words can change the world, and um, so I'm really interested in this and looking at how we can um, really well. I use it with my parents and uh, my children all the time, but that 
when you looked at the, when you asked for evidence, I find that such a great question personally and professionally in terms of <laughs> what is your evidence for that statement? And because when people actually are asked that, usually there's very little evidence. So um, I, I just found that last little bit that I listened to really um, helpful, but also uh, just reminded me of the the words that stu have stuck with me from working with you many, many years ago. No, oh, thank you so much, Anna. And it's nice, I recognized your name straight away. <laughs> your face. Um, we've recorded this. So if you drop uh, Mirja a line, she can share the recording with you. Um, as I said, the, there is also the podcasts that have got also the uh, make me feel in it. That's another one, one of the other areas. Absolutely. You can come to the upwording practice, peer practice any time. I mean, any Friday. Uh, you might find it worse that nobody's there on that Friday. If you want to join the WhatsApp group, great. What, what I invite you to do is uh, email, in fact, email communicate at upwording.com because Megan and from next week, Jenny, who are the producer administrators for it, will then uh, send you the link as well as invite you to the WhatsApp group if you want to be on it. Yes, that would be brilliant. Yeah, lovely. I've I've been, yeah, I don't know why I haven't picked up on this over the last few years. I do get your emails. But yes, now I've, I've found it now. But yes, right. I'll never forget when you said, what did you say? Um, I think rather than saying to a child, make sure you don't spill that, you say oh, yeah. um, walk with confidence across the room. And yeah, yeah stay absolutely. the parent. Yeah, which <laughs> is like, oh, you. see if you can get the glass of milk across the room in one piece. Yeah. Because the focus is on, on having it there. Great, in one piece. Oh, I've got to spill it, got to spill it. Yeah. Now, thank you for remembering that. Uh, yes, Mirja. Uh, I wanted to thank you so much. That was uh, really enlightening. I learned uh, a few more things, actually. I found especially the concept of conscious, considered choice. Mm. So interesting. Oh. Um, yeah, I think this is this is actually explicitly, this is it, what what creates this, this mindset change. And um, yeah, really, really great. As uh, Rivka already said, I would like to send you um, the presentation. Mm -hmm. Um, a question to both of you. Did you sign up also via the LinkedIn? So then I have your contacts there. Could you unmute yourself again, Anna? I wasn't on LinkedIn 24 hours ago when I saw this, hence why I emailed you and said, because I didn't use it. I didn't realize the world still used it, to be honest. But then I went to a, uh, I went to a event with Central Cultural Change yesterday and their new group is on LinkedIn. So I've made a profile. So I am now, but oh, you also nice. have my personal email. Um, I don't know why you haven't got my professional. So what's, yeah, shall I just e email you my details and you can send me everything? Yes, please. And I'm going to stop the recording now, actually. <laughs> okay. So you've got me.